Hi, so in the previous video we looked at what happens when we change the interest rate for borrowers and savers in the two-period intertemporal choice model. In this one we're going to try to decompose those effects into income and substitution effects. So in the previous video we looked at what happens when we increase the interest rate, so that will pivot the budget constraint through the initial income point. If you're not sure how that works then check out the previous video which should be linked uh, but let's assume that we do understand how that all works and so we pivot the budget constraint through here and then the consumer has a new optimization problem with respect to this new budget constraint uh, so we have some preferences which are shown by this indifference curve one and the new optimization point where their indifference curves are tangent to the budget constraints and we're at the highest possible indifference curve. Uh, if we look, it'll be somewhere around here. So if I can roughly draw a tangency condition, something like this, not a great drawing, but it will do for this purpose. We move up to a higher indifference curve I2 and we have a tangency point about here. So if we draw the values of C1 and C2 for that, we will have C2 star star and squeeze in a C1 star star. That's our new consumption. So we, we move and we increase C1 and we also increase consumption of C2 after this change in interest rate. Uh, so intuitively, as we saw in the previous video, this is a saber as they were initially consuming less than their income in period one and so saving that income and consuming more than their income in period two and we see that this is still the case even after the change in interest rate uh, but why why have they changed their consumption in this way it comes from an income effect and a substitution effect so let's first intuitively think about these so let's think about what the intertemporal budget constraint looks like, which we derived in a previous video. It says that we have y1 plus y2 over 1 plus r equal c1 plus c2 over 1 plus r. And so our budget constraint changes because we change the sign of r in, in this intertemporal budget constraint. And in fact, we are increasing R. And what we have is a saver. So they are saving some amount of money at the interest rate R, and we have increased it. So that effectively increases the present value of that consumer's income because they get a higher return for the income that they're saving. And so this effectively increases their income. So we have an income effect, or I'll just call that IE, where we have an increase in present value income, which means that the consumer can increase their consumption. And more specifically, it means that they can increase both their consumption of C1 and C2, which is why we see both C1 and C2 increasing in, in the diagram. However, we also have what we call a substitution effect. So if I just quickly create some space here, what the substitution effect says is that when we, we change the interest rate, or in this case we're increasing the interest rate, what we're doing is we're changing the relative price of consumption in two different periods. We think of the interest rate as the sort of price of deferring income from period one to period two, or the price of borrowing where we defer our period two income into period one. So when we change prices of two things, we are going to substitute from one good into the other. In this case, we substitute across time. So if we increase the interest rate, what we're doing is we're effectively making consumption in period one more expensive. So here, we think of the interest rate as the price of C1 consumption. Why is this? Well, imagine we're borrowing to finance consumption one, or consumption in period one. Uh, if we increase the interest rate, 
then we're going to be increasing the cost of borrowing that money to consume in period one. So in, in that way, we can see directly it's increasing the price of borrowing. However, when we're saving, the, the same is true. It's just a bit less intuitive. It's, it's more that we're getting more value from saving. So it, it seems, or well, we can interpret it more as that we're decreasing the price of consumption in period two, or by saving, we can increase the amount that we can consume in period two. So there's a substitution effect, which, as I said, is effectively increasing the price of consumption in period one. So this will be have a negative effect on consumption in period one and a positive effect on consumption in period two. So we have our income effect, which is increasing consumption in both, and our substitution effect, which is decreasing consumption in period one and increasing consumption in period two. We can actually show these two effects on our diagram, so that is what I'm going to do now. Well, there is a little trick that we use to decompose these, and this is by drawing a third hypothetical budget constraint, which we don't actually observe at all, but it allows us to find, find the difference between these two curves. So what we're going to do is draw a budget constraint that is parallel to the second budget constraint, but is tangent to the first indifference curve. Now I'll try to draw something like that. It's not going to be perfect, um, but if I if I rotate that round, it will it will look something something along the right lines. Hopefully, it's clear what I'm trying to do there. And so, what what we had was we had the original budget constraint, budget constraint one here. We have moved to budget constraint two, and then we've drawn this hypothetical budget constraint three. And so this is tangent at to indifference curve one at this new point. If I can squeeze that in on this little diagram, C2 triple star, C1 triple star. Sorry that this diagram is getting very messy. I will now switch to a third colour and hopefully I can explain it in words a bit better than I'm showing it on a diagram. So we, we had our initial diagram with tangency conditions on I1 and I2 and so the, the initial thing we observed was this C2 star and this C1 star and then after the interest rate changes we observed the new choice of the consumer which is C2 star at, or C2 star star and C1 star star. However, diagrammatically, we can decompose this by shifting our indifference curve to keep the consumer at the same, the same indifference level or the same utility level I1, but with, but with the new relative prices of the after after we've changed uh, the interest rate. Now, maybe maybe that sounds a bit intuitive as to why we're doing that, because we should know that shifting our budget constraint inwards, so shifting shifting budget constraint, that reflects just a pure change in income with no price effects, whereas pivoting a budget constraint, pivot budget constraint. That implies a change in relative prices. I'm not sure why my pen isn't working very well. Sorry about that. But so the reason we decompose into these two forms is because we have an effective pivot of the budget constraint from BC1 to BC3, where we're pivoting around indifference curve one. And then we have a shift of the budget constraint from BC3 to BC2. And so the pivot, which is given by, uh, let's write this on here. So we pivot from BC1 to BC3 around the initial indifference curve, I1, and we then shift from BC3 to BC2. 
Uh, so this this decomposition uh, was kind of designed by Hicks, and we and then we can we can write this in terms of a Slutsky decomposition, which I won't go into. But what we can basically see is for our pivot of the budget constraint, we move from C1 star to C1 star 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 uh, with the three three stars or and the same for C2 star to C2 star 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 so we can see that this movement if I highlight here is our substitution effect because that's our pivot and again on the x-axis if I can find some space to write this we have C1 star to C1 star star is our other substitution effect uh, as you can see, as we as we thought of it intuitively, our substitution effect in C2 increases C2 because by increasing the interest rate, we are effectively increasing the price of consumption in period one. So we substitute from C1 into C2. And as you can see, our substitution effect on the x-axis is negative. Our substitution effect decreases C1 and increases C2. That's our substitution effect. And that's shown by a pivot of the budget constraint around the initial indifference curve. And now we want to look at the income effect, which is just shown by shifting a parallel shift in the curves, which we do from BC3 to BC2, which is our final indifference curve, we've just added this intermediate step. So this shift moves us from the triple stars to the double stars. So we are at this point. So our income effect is given by C2 star 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 to the C2 star stars and the same for C1. C1 triple star to C1 double star. Now, if we look on the y-axis, C2 triple star to C2 double star, again, it's an increase in C2. And if we look on the x-axis, C1 triple star to C1 double star, that is, a, that is also an increase in C1. So our income effect is purely positive. Now, that's exactly what we said would happen when we were just thinking intuitively because by increasing the interest rate, we have just increased a saver's income. So it makes sense that if by increasing their income, we shift their budget constraint out and they will increase more in both periods. However, by changing the prices of something, we increase the consumption of one thing and decrease the consumption of the other. So that's our substitution and income effects. Uh, if we increase income, we're increasing consumption of both. However, substitution effect will always be positive for one and negative for the other. Now, I won't go over the borrower diagram as showing the saver one has been a bit of a nightmare. Um, but if we think about it intuitively, if we increase the interest rate for a borrower, we're going to have the exact opposite income effect because a borrower is borrowing. So by increasing the interest rate, we will be effectively decreasing their present value income. So their income effect will be negative, and so it's just the opposite of what we found for the saver. However, the substitution effect will be exactly the same. Because what we've done is decompose this, a substitution effect is effectively just a change in the relative prices, and that doesn't matter if you're a saver or a borrower. If you increase the interest rate, you are increasing the price of consumption in period one. So what changes between savers and borrowers is purely the income effect that changes. Savers are happy if you increase their interest rate, however borrowers are unhappy because you increase the income of a saver but you decrease the income of a borrower. The substitution effect just depends on relative prices, so that is exactly the same for both savers and borrowers. So that just about wraps it up for this video. Please do drop a like if it was at all useful and subscribe for future videos like this and check out the playlist for the previous and future videos on intertemporal choice.